Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Many of our infantry outfits contain units which go back to the earliest days of American history. The 3rd Infantry Division, for instance, contains units which have distinguished themselves in all wars where American fighting men have defended their country. The history of this division is studded with honored names and deeds. One of the most illustrious veterans of this division is a man named Audie Murphy. He's the most combat-decorated soldier of World War II, now a motion picture star in Hollywood, but still active as a captain in the 36th Infantry Division of the Texas National Guard. That's right, Sergeant Queen. But you know, I'm still a soldier at heart. You see, I never stopped being interested in my old outfit. Being a soldier is still very important to me. In other words, you mean you still keep in touch with your old outfit? Very much so. I try to be with them whenever there's any kind of reunion or get together. And of course, I always watch for any mention of the division when they're in action. Well, they certainly saw action in Korea and piled up quite a record. Yes, and the amazing thing is they did it in a hurry. In the summer of 1949, the division was stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia. They paraded for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The ranks of the division were filled with new men, and it was all spit and polish as the third helped carry out the peacetime mission of the Army, which has prepared us. That mission developed meaning on June 25, 1950. You mean Korea, Audie. We who were still in the third division were watching that situation develop hearing about the North Koreans moving against the government of South Korea and attempting to take over the whole works. They were trained and prodded by the communists who called themselves the People's Army of North Korea. But it sure seemed as though their enemy was the people themselves. South Korean troops put up a rather disorganized resistance to this aggression. Their small U.S. equipped army had been surprised and bewildered by the vehemence of the North Korean attack. What began as a political argument was turned into a hot war. The United Nations intervened, and by November 1950, the third division was in Korea. We mobilized our men and equipment and moved up the east coast of the Korean peninsula to engage the North Korean army on their right flank. The spit and polish of our peacetime training gave way to the tactical problems of the battlefield. By December, we'd advanced beyond the port of Wonsan. But it was here that we discovered that our real enemy was the Chinese communists, millions of them. With the entry of the Chinese forces into the conflict and the subsequent fallback of the United Nations troops, the 3rd Division assumed a defensive mission in the Hamhung Hungnam area, trading time for space. We took up positions to cover the withdrawal of two other divisions into the Hungnam perimeter, holding on to the beachhead until all the remaining units and equipment of the 10th U.S. Corps had been evacuated. Our artillery stood off the advancing communists while the troops were loading aboard landing craft and pushing out to waiting transports. It was a bitter blow to a lot of us who had thought we might be home for Christmas. Yes, I'll never forget that Christmas. We were almost the present. Tremendous mountains of supplies and stores. But we got it all off the beach, along with thousands of refugees and all of our wounded and disabled. Head narrowed as the communist net was pulled tighter. But even then, we weren't leaving anything for the Reds to make use of when we met them again. 
With all of our troops safely evacuated, the engineers gave the Reds a final salute. When we arrived in Pusan, one of the largest beachhead operations had been completed, in reverse. For us in the 3rd Division, it was the end of a saga that had begun with extreme confidence and ended with a much wiser picture about the enemy we were fighting. We rolled onto the beaches of South Korea with all of our equipment. Special attachments made it possible for vehicles to wade ashore without stalling out. We moved out promptly to assigned areas about 35 miles north of Pusan. By New Year's Day, all the troops in the division were ashore. Even the prisoners. One portion of the Red Army that wouldn't get another chance to fight against us. With the cold of the first Korean winter beginning to settle in, we stood guard on the fringe of Pusan. But headquarters was making plans for taking the road back to the battle line. And just before we moved out, we were inspected by the commander of the UN forces, General Douglas MacArthur. Tactical aircraft led the way. Their objective, wiping out anything their bullets and rockets could spot. With increasing momentum, we moved northward to engage the enemy. Our objectives were in the center of the battle line that extended across the breadth of Korea. It seemed simple enough on a map, but it was a matter of moving fast in some places or inching along under withering enemy fire, stalled until we could locate and wipe out the trouble spot. It was up and down the Korean hill flushing out units and picking off stragglers, or those who stayed to the last to harass our advance. We chased the Reds to the bank of the Han River, and that was the location of a weird duel, opposing forces sniping away at each other. We used every piece of firepower we could muster, but this was a contest in which the Reds were holding the short end of the stick. We just couldn't be stopped and we pushed our way across and kept advancing. We steamrolled it into Seoul, the capital city, and artillery continued to chase the enemy. It was at this time that we heard the announcement that General Matthew B. Ridgway was our new commander. We pushed northward into an area which later came to be known as the Iron Triangle. The 3rd Division got to know the place real well. I'll never forget that triangle. It was shaped something like a noose. G2 had a line on a lot of communist activity in the triangle. Big build-up. They built up, all right. And when they moved out against us, there were 200,000 commies pitted against our part of the triangle. It was the communist spring offensive. And despite the fact that we threw everything we had at them, their numerical superiority was just too big. And the order came to pull back.
We moved south over terrain that would melt during the days of the spring thaw and freeze up during the night. That crazy Korean weather was true to form. For some time now, the enemy had been calling the signals. It was time to seize that essential combat ingredient called initiative. And our command had a plan of their own. Counterattack. Drive back up the peninsula. The division received orders to reconnoiter counterattack routes. Despite mud, tank ditches, and mines, tanks and infantry moved out to the north once more. As we pushed the Reds back, it was almost the same as once again bunching their resources for them. Through burned out villages where every doorway contained the possibility of a sniper, the advance continued into the Korean central mountain sector. But the Reds still had some arrows left, and in the middle of May, they let loose the shaft, and we were once again slugging it out toe to toe. They gave way before our firepower, as we gave them a real licking. We were beginning to catch on to this hill fighting, working close to the artillery support. Not giving an enemy bunker the chance to suddenly come alive. Or a haystack, the opportunity to mow down a field of 3rd Division soldiers. Yes, we were catching on to the only way to go about conducting a campaign in this country. Just fight your way up and down the hills. The drive carried us through rice fields, and the pace increased as the enemy fell back. This was a full-scale United Nations offensive. Operation Piledriver was what it was called, and it was regaining all ground previously lost to the Reds in the high tide of their spring offensive. About two weeks, we moved, sometimes twice every day. It was the same all along the United Nations lines, keep swinging at the Reds while they were still dazed. The Chinese were taking a terrific shellacking, and we in the 3rd Division were getting in our licks. developed for containing the communists in the Iron Triangle. The 3rd Division was assigned the task of anchoring the western end. Korean refugees came pouring through the 38th parallel, the line which separated communist-dominated Korea from the south. And as they vacated, the armor of the 3rd Division moved in to tighten up the battle line. visitor came to look at these preparations, General James Van Fleet. He'd taken over command of the 8th Army from General Ridgway, who had become United Nations Supreme Commander in the Far East. Our new commander wore his pearl-handled sidearms as he inspected our setup. The way ahead was first softened by a barrage from artillery and aircraft. When we moved out, it was with the confidence of superior firepower, but we jumped right into a hornet's nest. 
The hills surrounding the Chorwan Reservoir were deeply entrenched. Chinese commanders depended upon the weight of massed infantry, trying to smother the UN guns with the bodies of peasant soldiers. The price paid by the Reds was great, as many of their units disintegrated into disorganized fragments, wandering aimlessly over the blood-soaked hills until they were captured. Commanding General Robert H. Soule had elements of the 3rd Division on the move. Units took up blocking positions or speeded to help other outfits as reinforcements. The enemy developed a new wrinkle in defensive tactics and opened the reservoir gates to flood the area and harass UN operations. But the stunt was unsuccessful and the game of hare and hounds continued. Southern anchors of the Triangle were secured, and the division moved in to mop up any remaining communist troops. Still no change in our attitude toward empty enemy bunkers. But if the area was cleared, no one told the Reds. While we moved easily in the valleys, they filtered back into the hills and counterattacked with ferocity. 3rd Division Artillery moved in to plug the gaps with firepower. But even as the Iron Triangle was wiped clean, it became evident that the Reds had to be eliminated in the Silbang Mountains. Their occupation of hilltops gave them observation and an approach to our defense line. Operation Donut was set up to neutralize the enemy advantages. Units moved out to completely encircle the entire triangle and blast the Reds off the hilltops. There were reds on just about every piece of elevated real estate, deeply entrenched. Four artillery battalions, supported by napalm bomb carrying aircraft, were brought up to support the assault. Everything from 30 caliber ammunition to bombs of jellied gasoline directed at installations on those hills. Numbers on a map. Digits like Hill 717 and 682 became great smoldering mounds. Again and again, the aircraft came in to hit with bombs, bullets, and rockets. Infantry moved in to consolidate and put the finishing touches to a successful operation. The Reds were ringed by Operation Donut, and the Triangle, once a convenient breakout point, had become neutralized. The job of cleaning up began for all on the south side of the battle line. Civilians were assisted in the care of their sick and wounded. Initial peace talks tended to slow the progress of the war. When we first heard about them, the attitude of most men in the line was, well, hope it works, but let's keep our powder dry. General Soule welcomed new strength to the division as the Philippine Expeditionary Force came to take their place with the United Nations forces. These rugged troops fought with distinction. 
Although the topography of the Philippines resembles the Korean countryside, they had to endure great changes in climate, a condition difficult to overcome during a time of war. There were troops of other nations, too, who fought with the Rock of the Marne men. Belgium and Greece sent battalions. These units became part of the pool of strength which the 3rd Division contributed to the fighting up and down the hills of Korea. A brief lull came to an end with Operation Cleanup. Tanks went on the move as the plan was put into action. It was designed to disrupt supply and communications lines, destroy troops, knock out artillery and mortar positions, and occupy the ridge line running west of Chorwan. The division plan of cleanup merged with orders from Corps for the establishment of the Line Jamestown. Tanks and infantry battered their way forward to secure positions that would simplify the problems of supply to the forward areas. Bunker positions were established as Jamestown was nailed down. Then the division was pulled out, having been in the line continuously for more than 10 months. A USO show played to more than 20,000 men and starred Jack Benny. And these were the first curves, other than the profiles of the Korean hills, that anyone had seen for months. There were a few days of rest then work began again, building, training, integrating new men into the units. Our engineers shaped out a program of rebuilding that fitted in with the requirements of training. But there was still a war going on, and it wasn't long before the 3rd Division was back in it fighting our way up a hill and down the other side to find another hill. In each new area of operation, there was always the problem of those Koreans who had been caught in the whirlwind of swiftly changing battlefields. They had little choice, these old men and women, mothers and babies. They had to be evacuated whenever possible. Infiltrators were a constant problem. Sometimes they were just civilians from whom it was possible to obtain information. And other times they were spies playing a deadly game of hide and seek. But they were all interrogated and their answers evaluated. More campaigns, more battle plans, more hills, more numbers on a map, like Hill 477, 355, 369. Hills right down to the day that General Mark Clark made an announcement. We have stopped the shooting. That means much to the fighting men and their families. And it will allow some of the grievous wounds of Korea to heal. Therefore, I am thankful. It is, however, only a step toward what must yet be done. The task now is to put the ceasefire agreement into full effect as quickly as we can and get down to working out an enduring settlement of the Korean problem. October 29th, 1954 was almost our fourth anniversary in Korea the day that we passed in review for General Maxwell D. Taylor and 3rd Division Commander Major General Charles Cannon. And as the band played, it was for the men we left behind. 
men of the 7th, 15th, and 65th Infantry Regiments, the 9th, 10th, 39th, and 58th Artillery Battalions, the 3rd Anti-Aircraft and the 64th Heavy Tank Battalion, and the others in the Engineers, Medics, Ordnance, MP, Recon, and Signal Outfits, the Quartermasters, the Band, they all shared in any honors we got back home from the people of New Orleans, including our old buddy, Audie Murphy. They all said, welcome home, 3rd Division. Thanks for a swell job. That's the story of the 3rd Infantry Division in Korea. And we're most grateful to Audie Murphy, one of America's fighting heroes, for helping us to tell it. Sergeant Queen, it's a story I get a big kick out of telling. Because the 3rd is one fine outfit. I've always been proud of the division and its accomplishments, and very proud of the fact that I was one of its soldiers. And I'm grateful to the big picture for letting me help tell part of the story. This is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Be with us again next week for another look at your army in action on The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of The Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.